Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series of lessons, lessons is entitled, The Least of These, Ministering to Those in Need. And we're down to number nine in that series, and this is entitled, Ministry in the New Testament Church. What does that make you think of? What, what comes up to your mind when you say ministry in the New Testament church? Well, that'll be our discussion today. As usual, we begin with the word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here to talk about your word, to remind ourselves of the events that happened so soon after you were here on this earth. Those people who came together and did a marvelous work and spread the gospel so quickly to many people help us to know what their secret was, and how we might exemplify that in modern times is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Matthew 28, and 28, 18 through 20 has been considered to be a mission statement for the Christian church. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but let me just read it for a moment. Jesus drew near and said to them, he's talking to his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything, everything I've commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Okay? How much does that include? Could we today go teach, baptize, and make disciples, or is that just the pastor's work? wondered about that when I read this. It's something we <laughs> automatically sort of think it's the minister's work. Yeah. Jesus also said we should do everything else he commanded us to do. Have you stopped to think about how much that includes? Well, what happened during the ministry of Jesus himself? Think about those three and a half years that he was in his ministry. What happened during those three and a half years that led to his disciples to organize this new community the way they did was there did he give them community give them directions okay after i'm risen from the dead i want you to do this and this maybe in the time after he arose from the dead he said that said those things that's a possibility because they sure didn't have that idea while he was alive i think all he did was the teaching that he had before he or gave up before he died he told them basic principles. In many places he says, well, you've heard it said, but I'm going to tell you something, a different twist on things. And with that, they exercised their brain, and uh, when, they were, when he was gone, they picked up. It's interesting, if I were to ask you just off the cuff, where did the disciples come from? I think most of us would end up guessing, at least, that most of the disciples originally came from Galilee. And now all of a sudden it seems like they're all spending their time in Jerusalem. Did they move to Jerusalem? And Peter, we know for sure, and maybe some of the others had families. Did their families move to Jerusalem? What, what's going on in this Jerusalem stuff? Um, and well, we know that... Well, when you're elected to Congress, you have to go to... I uh, see, okay. <laughs> you have to and, go to where Congress is. Yeah, and... Peter gives up, gets up and gives his first speech, and all of a sudden there are 3,000 people, and not very long later, there are 5,000, and that's just counting men. Where do you put a group like that? And how do you feed them? How do you, where do they sleep? I mean, with these, how many of these people were living in Jerusalem? What, he had to, what they had to say was something far better than what they've been raised with. Yeah. And so... But uh, you just mentioned something. Were they all living in Jerusalem? Obviously not. They, yeah. When we read the history of, uh, no, these folk were from all over who went there. Yeah. So what happened here? It's interesting that there is some hint. Uh, someone came along, and I don't know what their aim was, about 10 years after Jesus died, and did a kind of survey of how many people were attending Passover, and he estimated that there were two million. Two million people. <laughs> How did Jerusalem accommodate, accommodate all those people? Poorly. Poorly, probably. 
And we know that that's exactly the time the Romans chose to attack Jerusalem. When the, the city was full, of, completely full of, of Passover. The, it, it, Ellen White says that if, they, if the Roman army had attacked at a time when there was a normal population in Jerusalem, they probably could have survived quite a long time. But here you've got two million people, or at least a major portion of them, jammed in the city and all of a sudden here's the Roman army sieging the place. And, I mean, what do you do? Well, we know that in the early days of Christianity when they went to Jerusalem, what we read of during the times of Jesus himself, and shortly thereafter, the disciples liked to meet in the home of John Mark's parents and what came to be known as the upper room. But there is no way that the entire Christian group could meet in one room. If the number of men was from 3,000 to 5,000, it would be difficult even for them to meet in one of the side porches or side areas of the temple. The whole temple courtyard would be full. I mean, and, and, and try to think about it now. What we know about the animosity of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees to them, what do they do if half of the temple courtyard is full of Christians celebrating the life and death of Jesus? Well, at least early on they were all Jews. Yeah. Well, but th there's no way these people could have gotten into the area that was for Jews only, not even the ghost of a chance. Oh, but you can go into the area that's for the Gentiles if you're a Jew. It's just you can't do yeah. the reverse. No, no, I, I understand. But I'm saying that even the area that was for Gentiles would be chock-a-buck full of people. Yeah. Well... if they had several services. Without a doubt, these were momentous occasions. We don't, we, know, we don't know how for sure how much time passed between Acts 2 and Acts 4, but look at these words, Acts 2, 42 to 47. Carrie? They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles, and everyone was filled with awe. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. Day after day they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. It comes from the Good News Translation of the Bible. Wow. So does that mean that the people who met as a group were the ones being saved? It sort of sounds like that, doesn't it? So how did this group support themselves during that period of time? It's, we know that uh, at least occasion, some of them members sold their land and houses and contributed funds but, I mean, were Ananias and Sapphira the only ones who tried to cheat when they sold their property? You know about the, the, the story there in Acts 5, 1 to 11. And uh, the other question I'd like to ask is, how many of the people joined the group because they were healed? Did some of these people contribute to the support of the group? And in, in sort of confirmation of that, I'd like to read three verses from Luke 8. Now, this would be quite a ways further back into the ministry of Jesus, but this is what it says. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through the towns and villages pre preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. So these are women who had been healed, it sounds like. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So and at that Joanna point, Joanna was speculated to be the mother of the young no, that child be, that was raised. Uh, yeah, correct. Yes, raised from the dead. Yeah. Oh uh, no, no, no. This would be the mother of the child who the he, the husband w came from Capernaum over to um, Cana and met Jesus there. And Jesus said, "Go back." your child as well. He, she right. would be... It's something... Another that, miraculous healing. Yeah, but, uh, another yeah. miraculous healing. Um, 
Look at Acts 3, 1 to 11. One day Peter and John went to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hour for prayer. There at the beautiful gate, as it was called, was a man who had been lame all his life. And the beautiful gate is the area, if my memory serves me right now, it's the area that divides the Gentile potential Gentile area, the marketplace area, from the Druze only area. Um, he had been lame all his life. Every day he was carried to the gate to beg for money from the people who were going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John going in, he begged them for, to give him something. They looked straight at him, and Peter said, Look at us. So he looked at them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said to him, I have no money at all, but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I order you to get up and walk. Then he took him by his right hand and helped him up. At once the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and started walking around. Then he went into the temple with them walking and jumping and praising God. I mean, <laughs> there's no way you could ignore some an event like that. The people there saw him walking and praising God, and when they recognized him as a beggar who had sat at the beautiful gate, they were all surprised and amazed at what had happened to him. So it seems in, in Acts 5, there's another one, it seems that literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of people were healed. You remember it says they, they, they brought people out and let them, let them lie on the street hoping that Peter's shadow would pass over them. Can you get healed by a shadow? <laughs> you can, you can be healed by Jesus. You can be healed by the Holy Spirit or the, apparently the disciples. Mm -hmm. not, the, not the shadow. Not the shadow. Well... Does Josephus allude to any of this stuff? He, he uh, I, I, I don't know if I could say anything about specifically about this, but he talked about Christ and some... Yes, I, that I remember, but I hadn't read all of the book. Okay, so we're still left with the question. We don't know for sure how he managed, they've managed to support themselves. Uh, Acts 6.1 talks about something. Sometimes later, sometime later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. That would be the Aramaic-speaking Jews. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds. And Ellen White had some things to say about that. Uh, Charles? The same principles of piety and justice that were to, be guide, to guide the rulers among God's people in the time of Moses and David were also to be followed by those given to oversight of the newly organized Church of God in the Gospel Dispensation. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 95, verse 2, chapter 9, uh, paragraph 2. I, I, I want you to, and you out there, I want you to imagine in your minds what it was like to go to the temple early in the morning and there would be some of the disciples preaching and talking about Jesus, wonderful stories about Jesus. But not only that, they would un undoubtedly be reporting about all the people who had been healed. I mean, how would we feel if we just came to church on Sabbath morning and people are talking about miraculous healings and maybe even people raised from the dead and you're hearing stories about Jesus that you've never heard before? Uh, it must have been a marvelous occasion. Um, <coughs> so now, let's talk about the organization. Would you call it a commune? Would you call it a kibbutz? Good Israeli term, similar to the New Testament model. Could we do that in our day? The Israelis still have kibbutzes. Yeah. I wasn't talking about it, really. I was talking about us. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I was just thinking what yeah. you said. And yeah. I happened to see something the other day, a picture of a Jewish lady in Israel trying to find a meal out of a trash bin. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, in those days, people, the, 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 the believers were willing to give up almost everything because they really believed that Jesus would come back very soon. Were they deceived? Or... We, I mean, this gives us a pause, you know, why? Um, were they not reading what the Lord was 
what the Lord so plainly said or what is so much full of the Lord is coming. I mean, uh, 70 AD didn't come yet, and he predicted that to come, mm -hmm. to happen. Well, I'm sure they were so excited about this, it was, it was like nothing else had ever happened in their lives. Um, what about us? Do we believe Jesus is coming back soon? We've been saying it for <laughs> oh, almost, a, well, over 150 years. Almost 175 years. Yeah. And I think in the way the the world news runs every day. I think it's a lot closer than we Boy. think. Well, great things were being done to promote the work of God in other places besides Jerusalem. And we... we well, I suppose we have time to read a few verses here. Look at Acts 9, 36 to 41. In Joppa, there was a woman named Tabitha who was a believer. Uh, the original language actually says disciple. Her name in Greek is Dorcas, meaning a deer. She spent all her time doing good and helping the poor. At that time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed and laid in a room upstairs. Joppa was not very far from Lydda, and when the believers in Joppa heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him with the message, Please hurry and come to us. So Peter got ready and went with them. When he arrived, he was taken to the room upstairs where all the widows crowded around him, crying and showing him all the shirts and coats that Dorcas had made while she was alive. Did they expect uh, some, something to happen if she was already dead? Sounds like it. Yeah. Remember that Jesus told his disciples on the very first time he sent them out to minister in Galilee, he told them, raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Is this the first example we have documented of the disciples raising the this dead? This is the first documented case we have of the disciples raising the dead, yes. Well, Peter put them all out of the room, knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to the body and said, Tabitha, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Peter reached over and helped her get up. Then he called all the believers, including the widows, and presented her to, alive to them. The news about this spread all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed on in Joppa for many days, and we know about other events that happened later as a result of that. Wow. So, where did Dorcas get the idea to, of doing what she was doing? Did she know about Matthew 25 where it says, anything you've done unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me? I suspect that she was doing things like this before, even before she became a Christian. It's very possible. Yeah. Well, think what an, an impact, it must, impact it must have had on the city of, of Joppa. By the way, you, uh, if you go to Joppa today, you will find interesting exhibits around there about other events from the Old Testament. Nothing from the New Testament as far as I could tell. This is an Israeli city. What kinds of miracles will attend the final outpouring what of the whole... Old Testament things happened in Joppa? Well, there was the story of Jonah and the fish. Uh -huh. And if you, drive, if you drive around the things, you'll find a big old fish were there other things where Joppa was mentioned besides Jonah? What I remember is the big fish yeah. seeing there. Okay. Uh, what kind of miracles do you think are going to attend the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain? Is there any reason why uh, people couldn't be healed miraculously even raised from the dead? And here's the question that I always raise when I think about that. How would that be reported in, on TV or on newspapers the next morning? Someone is raised from the dead and it's documented that they're dead. They're raised by some Christian going and praying from them, reaching out a hand and raising them to their life again. And the newspapers and the TV are going to say what? The doctor has made a mistake. Wasn't really dead. Well, I mean... Presumably, God will allow it to happen in cases where it's going to be pretty hard to say that. Then what? Would this lead to a lot of people all of a sudden giving attention to focusing on God's true people? 
as a possibility. Well, not everyone who became one of the new Christians had his life and health perpetuated. Do you so, think, of by course... By the way, you know, the news might not cover it, but Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and so on, it would probably spread like wildfire. Yeah. Well, think of the story of Stephen in Acts 7. He gave that fantastic sermon and then he was stoned. If something were to happen to you, how many people would be mourning thinking about the story of Dorcas? How many of us have practical skills such as Dorcas had that we are using in the service of others? Think of the example of Paul now. After that dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, 1 to 25, he spent about three years studying and preaching and preparing himself for a new ministry. What do you suppose he was doing during those three years? Remember that someone of Paul's stature very likely had the entire Hebrew Old Testament memorized. Okay? So you think about that. That's his stuff he has to work with and probably a lot of other ideas. I'm sure lots of other ideas, teachings of Pharisees and so forth. And what's he going to do now for the next three years? This is uh, the time that he spent in Arabia? Well, either in Damascus or Arabia. He, he was in Damascus for a while. He went to Arabia. He stayed a while. He came back to Damascus. And then three, days, three years later, at the end of three years, he went back to Jerusalem. So we don't know how much time he actually spent in Damascus and how much time he spent in Arabia, but probably most of it was in Arabia. Mm -hmm. Who was the other one who uh, figured that spent time in Arabia as well? There is another Bible character, I forget. It was Paul. Spent time in Arabia. It was well, Paul. Was Moses, of course. That's correct, yeah. yeah I think Midian. Was, uh, Midian, right. And, yeah, yeah. But, okay. Paul had to rethink his whole way of looking at all this. Stuff. It was a complete food basket upset, huh? But do you think that in that three and a half years that maybe God talked to him again? We don't know. Oh, he must have. I, I would be really surprised if he didn't. Yeah. And e Either directly or through angels. Yeah. Yes. And so now the next question is, Paul went forth from that experience and said, My, I'm committed to enter unentered areas. Unentered areas. Does that include any areas in Israel, Galilee, or Judea? No, probably not. Samaria, maybe. Well, there are other people already in Samaria. Right. That's why he went all places that he went. So it, it, it seems like by, by committing yourself to go to unentered areas, you almost committed yourself to go to Gentiles. Didn't he want to head off to Spain at one time? Uh, he talked about that. Yeah, so. yeah. Romans uh, 1 and 16. But everywhere he went, though, on Sabbaths, he found the synagogue and he worshipped there. Yeah. And often spent the next several weeks preaching in the synagogue yeah. until they threw him out. And what would his worship be? It would been more teaching, wouldn't it? Yeah. it sharing with the things that he learned. I mean... Well, Remember that, just to build on your point, the typical Jewish pattern was you read a section or maybe more than one section from the scriptures, in the Old Testament it would have been, and then you sit down and you you preach. Discuss it. Discuss it. You could do it like Jesus said. You have heard it said. And he says, now this is a different twist on things. Yeah. You know, that, that, that more, more logical than, than what you've been Matthew you know, five, ritualizing yeah. with. Well, in its early, year, early days, the Christian church was a subunit of Jewish believers. We know that. I mean, we're not aware that that initial group of 3,000, 5,000 in Jerusalem, we're not aware that there were any Gentiles among that group. There, there were some, probably some people from other groups that had been converted to Judaism and now became Christians because we know there were some like that that are later mentioned. Um, but we know what happened. When the missionaries to Antioch, um, let's just read that verse, what happened next. This is an incredibly important passage, I think, and I don't think I've ever heard anybody give a, even a sermon on it. 
Acts 11, starting with verse 19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed. And what happened when Stephen was killed among the Christians? Scattered. They were scattered, carrying the gospel with them, it says. Uh, Some of them went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. And how long was this after the death of Jesus? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, and they're still preaching what? To Jews only, except that some had gone to Samaria. But other believers who are from Cyprus and Cyrene, and Cyrene is a city, or was a city, in Libya, went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also. What the Greek says literally, to those who spoke Greek. That's what it says literally. Also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I want you to think about this for a moment. Uh, Someone shows up, starts preaching the, the, the truth in the in local, what, well, what we would call the local language in, in Greek, and what do you suppose the Holy Spirit and the angels are doing? They are out there, they are working as hard as they can in a place like that. For the first time, finally, they're spreading the gospel to Gentiles. Well, you know, soon Paul and Barnabas were sent off. They began speaking the the truth there in southern Turkey and spread the gospel to more Gentiles and pretty soon there was that crisis that led to the Acts 15 uh, conference uh, we know about. Well, let's talk about spreading the gospel. How well is the Seventh-day Adventist Church doing in reaching out around the world? We have in relatively recent years talked about the 1040 window. What's the 1040 window? On both sides of the equator. Okay. Working out. That's what they're starting to concentrate on, have for some time, and getting results. Yeah. Okay. Well, the result, partly of that and partly of what happened before that, more than 90% of the membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is now located in less developed countries. Since we are, we are a representative organization, that means that most of the people working at the General Conference should be coming from those countries. Is that a problem? And when they vote at the General Conference and they want to bring in their ideas about how things should be, is that a problem? I think we've seen a change. There are some coming in. I wouldn't say there are a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It all depends upon what those ideas are. Yeah. Yes. Of course, the big issue in recent years has been the ordination of women. Yeah. It's been a huge issue. You shouldn't have brought that up. Well, well the, we, <laughs> we deal with non-issues. That's the problem. Is so What if all the local churches were general conferences? How fast would the message spread? I I would like to say that in a little slightly different way. What if we were all out ministering to those around us as best we could and the gospel was going like wildfire? Would we be worried about things like... No, no, we would not be. So even though Paul went to faraway places in his ministry, he continued to think about the poor that he had left behind in Judea and Jerusalem and elsewhere. Gordon, I think you have something about that. Reading from Galatians 2.10, All they asked was that we should remember the needy in their group, which is the very thing I have been eager to do. And then Acts 20.35, 20, I, I have shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak, remembering the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. Where does he say that? Where does he say that? (laughs) Not recorded anything that we have. So where did he get that idea? But the the disciples, I'm sure, remembered lots of things that weren't recorded in the Gospels. Yeah. Of course, this is not the disciples talking. No, it's not. 
Well, it's very interesting to notice that most of the so-called saints from the Old Testament were among the rich and powerful. But as we study the New Testament church organization, it seems that the goal was to reach out to the poor and needy. Why this contrast? And to add to that, do we have well thought through strategies in our day for reaching both the rich and the poor? I'm going to give a quick answer to that of no. No. But maybe I don't know what all is going on. It is unfortunate, though. Um, I, I asked my friend, who was the, then the division president of one of the world's divisions, I said, hey, Gordy, what kind of work do we have among the elite in the country? Right away, he says, none. But we have, we, of all Christians, we, some the Adventists, have a golden opportunity to reach out to these folk. Yep. Yep. Exactly. What was that last part you said? That great opportunity to be able to reach out to these folk. Our health message really, truly resonates with these people all over. Yeah. Well, but uh, how about the? the, the, I'm, the right. They got to go to the poor folk, but what about the well-off f- the financially? Also. And it's pretty tough. You know, the old philosophy is: if you're well-off financially and your health is good, God's smiling on you. Yeah. And why would you look around for something different if... Uh, you really believe that God's smiling on you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's a serious uh, the, impediment. To the, the, the thing is, the reality is that um, with wealth comes uh, lifestyle problems. That's yeah. the point. That's our golden opportunity to be able to go to these folk. And it works. Mm-hmm. It works, this is from my own experience, it works beautifully. In Second Corinthians chapter 8... Paul has gone to what we might call hell and high water with the people in Corinth. And now they have come back and said, please, Paul, come back. We want you to come back. Paul is so happy. He writes them another letter, and this is part of that letter. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 to 15. I'm not going to take time to read it because I'm watching the clock. But Paul came up with a very interesting idea. He said, look, those people from Judea, the Jews have shared the riches of the Christian gospel with you. Now, you need to share the riches of your financial blessings with them. Is that a logical argument? Sure. Well, see. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, he uses an argument from the days of manna in Exodus sixteen four to 18. I'm just going to read a couple of the key verses. Um, let's see um, right, let's go down to 18 this, 17 and 18 Exodus 16 the Israelites did this some gathering more others less when they measured it those who gathered much more much did not have too much and those who gathered less did not have too little so uh, what's happening there? Is the angels sneaking some stuff from these guys who got too much and they're giving it to the people who <laughs> got too little? What do you think is happening there? I think it vaporized. The people who had too much. But what about the people who had too little? It multiplied. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, so what Paul is saying here that church members shouldn't give just impulsively. Someone makes a big appeal and whatever, give to this particular cause and everybody wants to give. But he said you must do it routinely. You must set aside money for the support of the ministry and the support of the needs in other parts of the world. Does that principle still apply to us? Well, it's there if you want to join in. Let's put it that way. I get mail every day about stuff like that. Yeah. So, to what extent should we be giving to local needs, even outside of the church organization, versus giving to the church for needs in other parts of the world? Is that... How do we make those choices? Is that a challenge? Do we give to the person on the corner? Yeah. 
Well, many scholars have recognized the Book of Romans as a kind of Magna Carta for the Christian Church. Beyond explaining why Jesus had to die and discussing other very important issues in that book, Paul had some very interesting words to say in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Jim? So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not confirm conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. So, now, what does it mean to offer yourselves as living sacrifices? Is God saying, I don't want dead pigeons anymore, I don't want dead lambs? What do you think? And that's what they thought. Remember, up to this point in time, they were still back in Jerusalem busy offering dead lambs. And God says, I don't want that. I want you, I want you to have, be so, like Paul, to be so filled with the gospel, so committed to the cause, that you're out there spreading the gospel. Forget the dead lambs. I mean, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. Uh, that was an important part of the gospel at that point but Paul, God says we need to move on now and God goes on to talk about spiritual gifts there in Romans 12 and elsewhere in Ephesians and so forth um, what are spiritual gifts do we have any here well, I, don't, I, I think it's to do with some people are born speakers. Some people get into trades, builders. There's all kinds of ways. You can. It's all it's all a talent from God. Mm -hmm. Now the ones that are mentioned are apostles, prophets, and so forth, or spreading God's message. To put that in uh, modern, more modern language, of serving, of teaching, of encouragement, even of having authority. Now. It, one of place that says showing kindness, we should do it cheerfully. He went on to say that love must be extended even to our enemies. Are we doing that? How many of us have actually tried? Let me ask you, have you tried to serve God in the ways Paul outlines there in Romans 12? It wasn't easy to be a Christian in Paul's day. I mean, we, we know that. The Roman Empire considered Christianity to be an illegal religion. What are the challenges of, of sharing the gospel in our day? We still have the poor. Have we eliminated homelessness and poverty? No. Well, when Paul went back to church headquarters in Jerusalem on different occasions, he always talked about James as being one of the leaders of the Christian church. There's good evidence to suggest that this was the James who was the stepbrother of Jesus. No actual relationship, but the son of, probably the firstborn son of Joseph before he married Mary and along with his other sons and daughters. However, his name was not James. We need to know that there was actually no one in the Bible by the name of James. The men who are called James in the New Testament were actually named Jacob. I think in German it's Jacobus. Yeah, in, in Greek it's Jacobo. Okay. But English translators of the Bible decided to change the names of all the Jacobs in the New Testament to James to make it easier to distinguish them from all the Jacobs in the Old Testament. Aren't you glad the translators are helping us here? The Spanish translators did the same. However, they called the Jacobs Santiago. Wow. Well, in any case, this James or Jacob who wrote the small book of James had some very clever, some very clear things to say about spreading the gospel and living a Christian life. He says in James 1.27, What God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, pure and genuine religion, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. Now, how often have you heard pastors get up and say, oh, let's all go out and take care of the widows and the orphans? 
Don't we believe in pure religion? Or do they say, let's do that this afternoon after we meet here, or tomorrow? Fine, I'm just asking you if you've heard the pastor say that. Mm-hmm. Not often. Not often. <laughs> okay. Well, look at James 2, 1-9. to My brothers and sisters, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. Suppose a rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes to your meeting, and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat here, but say to the poor man, oh, stand over there, or sit on the floor by my feet, then you are guilty of creating distinctions among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. Can you think of any other basis on which people might discriminate in our day? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, God chose the poor people of this world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you dishonor the poor. Who are the ones who oppress you and drag you before the judges? The rich. They are the ones who, who speak evil of that good name which, you have been give, which has been given to you. You will be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom which is found in the scripture. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we could go on, but let's... Um, and James 5, he really comes out with some woes against the, the rich people, doesn't he? Why does he speak so strongly against the rich? We have an interesting case of um, Nicodemus. Ellen White talks about Nicodemus. You know, he was a wealthy Pharisee. He came to Jesus and so forth. She says by the time he died, he was a poor man because he had given all of his wealth to the spread of the gospel. Did that happen to some other rich people in Jerusalem, do you think? It's possible. Yeah? So, was James or Jacob trying to appeal to the rich to share some of their goods with the poor and needy? And in, in the verses, take for example this um, James two fourteen to 17. Carrie? My brothers and sisters, what good is it for people to say that they have faith in their actions do not prove it? Can that faith save them? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in you saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. Okay, here's a, com- here's a question. You drive down the corner and you stop the stoplight and you're getting ready to make a left turn and there standing on the corner is someone in ragged clothes asking for money. Do you wave them and say, God bless you, keep warm, meet well? <laughs> That's kind of what he's referring to. Sounds kind of like that, doesn't it? Why is it so easy even subconsciously to prefer the rich over the poor? Because we hope that maybe they'll do something for us in turn. Some of it will rub off. Yeah, some of it will rub off. Okay. Now, one of the questions is James talking only about believers because he does call them the brothers and sisters. So does that mean we're only supposed to be generous with people who are church members? Everybody's got their minds full of all kinds of ideas, huh? Well, it depends on the situation. You could be in places where I've seen one or two kids trying to get home from the other side of the country or whatever. At least that's what they're showing. And it can, it's a bit of a gamble sometimes, but. Mm hmm. I, uh,. Happened to have a very good friend who unfortunately passed away from prostate cancer a while back. And when he was young, he grew up not far from where we're located here, over in Redlands. And he decided to go to school in one of our Adventist schools that's about, what, 400, 400 miles away, 
something like that. And in those days, he could not afford to pay for transportation. And so if he ever wanted to go home, he had to hitchhike. hitchhike yes. And this was in the days of, uh, you know, Hollywood was a big deal and so forth. And one time, it was late on Saturday night, and he was just coming into Los Angeles. I said, boy, what am I going to do? I was late in the night, and I'm just entering Los Angeles. I still have, what, 60 miles or so to go out to Redlands and so forth. And he was hitchhiking. I was taking his thumb out. And believe it or not, a very famous movie star stopped and picked him up. Gave him a lift quite almost all the way across Los Angeles. So who knows? Just an interesting case. Well, when Jesus left his disciples, what kind of Christian church did Jesus have in mind? Well, Charles? The Savior had, has given his precious life in order to establish a church capable of caring for sorrowful, tempted souls. A company of believers may be poor, uneducated, and unknown. Yet, in Christ, they may do a work in the home, in the neighborhood, in church, and even in the regions of regions beyond, whose results shall be as far-reaching as eternity. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 644. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then from Acts of the Apostles, page 344, unselfish liberality through the church, the early church into a transport of joy, for the believers knew that their efforts were helping to send the gospel message to those in darkness. Their benevolence testified that they had not received the grace of God in vain. What would produce such liberality but the sanctification of the Spirit? In the eyes of believers and unbelievers, it was a miracle of grace. Okay, now let me ask you a challenging <laughs> question. At least it was challenging for me to think about. That generosity which was took place there in Jerusalem and the tremendous spread of the gospel there in Jerusalem with 3,000 and 5,000, those, those big numbers we're talking about, is there evidence that that led to a quick spread of the gospel to even Gentile areas? No. The evidence is what caused them finally to carry the gospel to Gentile areas? Persecution. Yeah. The stoning of Stephen and persecution. Do we need a few stonings today? When the seventh, when there's a, as, as Revelation says, there's a mark of the beast, which we call a, a national Sunday law. When that happens, is, going to, is there going to be a mass exodus from some Adventist ghettos in certain places? What do you think? Well, it certainly brings up something to think about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we have hospital, <coughs> pardon me, hospitals that never close. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to be there on Sunday. Mm -hmm. How are we going to look at that? How is the government or the authorities going to look at that? Yeah. <coughs> well, in what ways do you think now? Let's let's. We're getting down to the end of our lesson. In what ways do you think our churches today should become like that early Christian church? If we developed a society that freely shared money and goods with others, would we attract a large group of homeless people? Is that what God intended? I had a homeless lady in the office today that um, I, she's, she comes and sees me, has seen me many, many times. She has all kinds of mental problems and because I didn't do exactly what she wanted me to do, she always comes in with a, what she thinks needs to be done. And she went out in the, in the lobby and announced to me, that, announced to the ladies in the front desk that she had reported me to the police. <laughs> is, that, is that the kind of people we need to be attracting? You didn't have chicken McNuggets for her ready to go. You know, they, people call the police for something that simple. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I think, in some ways, we possibly could do more for those kind of folk. However, you you have to be careful of 
who's involved with what kind of law and what kind of social worker or psychiatrist yeah. or somebody who's doing stuff. You got, we do have some st laws. You, got, you can't just go barging in. Yeah. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a well-defined system of tithing and offerings. That has served the church very well. It has been a very good way to sponsor work in unentered areas. There are still plenty of unentered areas, even in more developed countries. Do we have clear plans for reaching out to those areas? I mean, didn't Jesus say you spread the gospel to the whole world? Could we actually live out those directions? What would happen if the entire membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church said, okay, we are going to commit ourselves to reach everybody in the world? What would happen? Well, I think I... In, I just want to make a statement. Gordon read a little while ago, um, number 37, second paragraph. The unselfish liberality threw the early church into a transport of joy yeah. for the unbelievers, uh, but for the believing knew that their efforts were helping to send a gospel message to those in darkness. Even to these days, there are folk who send funds to many parts of the world. And it is important how our leaders handle that fund. Yeah. This is this is as sacred as what we call a tithe. Mm -hmm. um, it's heartbreaking when some of the reports that come in, uh, hopefully there are church leaders and uh, members who handle these funds are probably watching. Correctly. But it's important. It is important. We are going to be accountable someday for what we do with these funds that are sent out. And unfortunately, on the other side of that question, the rich tend not only not to feel any need themselves, but they don't want you to ask them to help anyone else. That makes it difficult to reach them. Did new Christian churches which sprang up following Paul's outreach follow the example of the Jerusalem church? If you lived in a place where Christians were forbidden from gathering... Would you dare to do what the Jerusalem believers were doing? How might a Paul or a small group of people like Paul's group approach an unentered city today? Have we personally, every one of us, you out there, have you accepted the challenge of Matthew 28, 19, and 20? Those early days of the Christian church were something like a giant camp meeting. Camp meetings are great to attend. Probably all of us have at one time or another. And they work for a while. However, sooner or later, some people are going to have to find ways to support themselves and, and others in the group. Today, we should, be, should we be selling our property and houses to support the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? We've read Acts 2, 41 to 47. In these verses, we should see that there were five main areas of emphasis. Worship, emphasis. Worship, fellowship, community services, reaping, and discipleship. And we need to remember that community services include miraculous healings and even resurrections from the dead. Are we doing any or all of those things? In the early days, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had a fairly well-known group, mostly women, who formed Dorka societies. These people gathered food, clothing, made things, collected unused items, and helped the poor. Do we need more of those kinds of societies today? Well, we don't have time to go through this now, but if you read through the spiritual gifts that are described in places like Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and 1 Peter 4, how well are we doing at doing, reaching out and doing those kinds of things? In that early Christian church, many women must have spent nearly full time preparing food. Would that be a spiritual gift? I, I think my wife has a spiritual gift of being a hostess. She does a marvelous job. She would be embarrassed to hear me talk about it, probably. It's important to remember that spiritual gifts are not just given to please us or for our personal benefit. They are given to help spread the gospel. 
So how do you relate to your church? Do you think of it like a musical society which you attend once a week and sit back and enjoy the performance? The church was intended to be a place where everyone, every individual, is involved in ministry. How well are we doing at that? Our lesson has focused on the reaching out to the poor, the needy, and those who are suffering. So what plans do we have for reaching those who are not suffering? Do we recognize that as we reach out to touch the lives of other people around us, we are supposed to be developing long-term relationships which lead to what? Some of them joining in God's people. When speaking about the church and doing evangelistic programs, do we frequently refer to the inspired Word of God rather than just giving our own ideas? Unfortunately, there's a, a unfortunately large group of people who tend to go out, oh, I've got some exciting new idea about this or that or the other, and there's not too much of the, crisp, crisp, the scripture being mentioned. Unfortunately, there are times when certain issues have split the membership of Christian churches. Who wants to join a church that's fighting? Well, thinking about uh, what happened with the disciples, just before Jesus left, he washed their feet. How soon after he was gone do you think the disciples started washing each other's feet? Remember, that was the job of who? The servant. A slave. <clears throat> well, think about all the things that happen in your church. The list of the things that the church is actually doing to try to spread the gospel, reaching out to other people and so forth. How many of those things are you involved in? Are you reaching out to your neighbors? Are you passing out literature? Are you... Think of the host of things that you could be doing. And are we... Are the Adventist churches doing very well at that? There are other Christian groups that (coughs) are passing out literature all the time and even to the annoyance of some people. But... We don't need to be do that, doing that. We need to make things available to people. We need to befriend them. That's probably the biggest issue. Befriend them and let them know that we care about them, that we want to help them, and we want them to be in the kingdom of heaven. I hope that's what you're doing each day. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this lesson and this message. May we be inspired and committed to doing things that we haven't thought of before, perhaps, to spread the gospel. We want to be more like you. May that be so each day is our prayer in Jesus' name.